Pulmonary hypertension is defined as a mean pulmonary arterial pressure of more than 20 mm of mercury at rest as assessed by right heart catheterization. Available data have shown that the normal mean pressure at rest is 14 plus minus 3 mm of mercury. Two standard deviations above this mean value would indicate that a mean pressure of more than 20 mm of mercury is the threshold for abnormal pulmonary arterial pressure. It is widely admitted that mean pulmonary artery pressure may be accurately estimated by using the standard formula. Mean pressure is equal to two-third of diastolic pulmonary artery pressure plus one-third of systolic pulmonary artery pressure. Due to the lack of reliable data that define which levels of exercise-induced changes in mean pulmonary artery pressure have prognostic implications, a disease entity pulmonary hypertension on exercise cannot be defined and should not be used. Right heart catheterization is commonly performed by accessing the common femoral vein in the leg, the internal jugular vein in the neck, or the antecubital veins in the arm. For example, in the leg the femoral vein becomes the external iliac vein and then drains into the inferior vena cava which in turn drains into the right atrium. When the catheter reaches the right atrium, a pulsatile right atrial waveform will be observed then the catheter is manipulated to turn towards the right ventricle and right ventricular pressure is obtained. Following this, the catheter is advanced to measure the pressure of pulmonary artery. The catheter is balloon tipped. After measuring the pressure of pulmonary artery, the catheter is positioned in a branch of the pulmonary artery and the balloon is inflated. The inflated balloon occludes the branch of the pulmonary artery and thus cuts off pulmonary arterial flow. When this occurs, the pressure in the distal port rapidly falls and after several seconds reaches a stable lower value which is called pulmonary artery wedge pressure. This pressure is not due to pulmonary arterial flow but due to the reversal of flow from pulmonary vein. This pressure is similar to left atrial pressure because the occluded vessel and its distal branches that eventually form the pulmonary veins act as a long catheter that measures the blood pressures within the pulmonary veins and left atrium. It is helpful to measure pulmonary artery watch pressure to diagnose the severity of left ventricular failure and to quantify the degree of mitral valve stenosis. Both of these conditions elevate left atrial pressure and therefore pulmonary artery watch pressure. Aortic valve stenosis and regurgitation and mitral regurgitation also elevate left atrial pressure. The normal pressure waves in the cardiac chambers during right heart catheterization with normal values are shown here. In the right atrium, a pulsatile waveform is seen and the pressure ranges from 0 to 8 mm of mercury. In the right ventricle, the systolic pressure ranges from 20 to 30 mm of mercury and the diastolic pressure ranges from 0 to 8 mm of mercury. In the pulmonary artery, the systolic pressure ranges from 20 to 30 mm of mercury and the diastolic pressure ranges from 8 to 15 mm of mercury. And finally, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure ranges from 8 to 12 mm of mercury. Now, hemodynamic definitions of pulmonary hypertension. The mean pulmonary artery pressure in pulmonary hypertension is more than 20 mm of mercury. If the pulmonary artery wedge pressure is less than or equal to 15 mm of mercury, 
it is called precapillary pulmonary hypertension and if the pulmonary artery watch pressure is more than 15 millimeters of mercury it is called postcapillary pulmonary hypertension in case of postcapillary pulmonary hypertension when the pulmonary vascular resistance is less than 3 wood units it is isolated postcapillary pulmonary hypertension and when the pulmonary vascular resistance is more than or equal to 3 wood units it is combined pre and post capillary pulmonary hypertension pulmonary vascular resistance is calculated by subtracting pulmonary artery wedge pressure from mean pulmonary artery pressure and then dividing the result with cardiac output it is expressed in wood units for example if mean pulmonary artery pressure is 16 mm of mercury, mean pulmonary artery wedge pressure is 6 mm of mercury, and cardiac output is 4.1 liters per minute, then pulmonary vascular resistance will be 2.44 wood units. Pulmonary hypertension can be clinically classified into five main groups. Group 1 is pulmonary arterial hypertension. Group 2 is pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Group 3 is pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases and or hypoxia. Group 4 is chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and other pulmonary artery obstructions. And group 5 is pulmonary hypertension with unclear and or multifactorial mechanisms. Pulmonary arterial hypertension is a clinical condition characterized by the presence of pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular resistance of more than 3 wood units. In the absence of other causes of pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, such as pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, or other rare diseases. Pulmonary arterial hypertension can be subdivided into idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension, drug and toxin induced pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension associated with connective tissue disease, HIV infection, portal hypertension, congenital heart disease, schistosomiasis pulmonary arterial hypertension long term responders to calcium channel blockers pulmonary arterial hypertension with overt features of venous or capillaries involvement and persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn syndrome idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension formerly called Primary pulmonary hypertension is a rare disease with different clinical phenotypes. By definition, it is diagnosed only after alternative diagnoses have been ruled out. Hereditary pulmonary arterial hypertension is an autosomal dominant disease characterized by reduced penetrance, variable expressivity, and female predominance. Most cases are caused by mutation in a gene called bone morphogenetic protein receptor type 2. Pulmonary arterial hypertension can be associated with exposure to certain drugs or toxins, particularly appetite suppressant drugs such as aminorex, flanfuramine derivatives, and benflurex. These drugs have been confirmed to be risk factors for pulmonary arterial hypertension. Pulmonary arterial hypertension develops in approximately 10% of patients with systemic sclerosis. Other forms of connective tissue associated pulmonary arterial hypertension have been less well studied. However, association with systemic lupus erythematosus has a better prognosis than systemic sclerosis. There is evidence of vascular involvement in HIV infection, 
including arteriopathy with severe intimal and smooth muscle hyperplasia in patients with AIDS. Portal hypertension is thought to predispose patients to disturbances in the homeostatic regulation of numerous neurohumoral and vasoactive mediators that induce the development of pulmonary arterial hypertension. In some congenital heart disease, there is increased vascular tone that results from an imbalance between vasodilators and vasoconstrictors, so-called pulmonary endothelial dysfunction. Schistosomiasis associated pulmonary hypertension is related to parasite egg embolization of the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary arteriopathy, and high flow states of the pulmonary arteries. In a small subset of vasoreactive patients, high dose calcium channel blockers markedly improve functional status and survival. Pulmonary venoclusive disease and capillary hemangiomatosis are rare forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Pulmonary venoclusive disease is characterized by progressive obliteration of pulmonary venules, elevation of arterial pressures, and increased vascular resistance, leading to right ventricular failure and death. Pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis is characterized by capillary proliferation and pseudo-invasion of collagenous septal structures. Pulmonary hypertension with reduced pulmonary blood flow is a normal physiologic state in the fetus because the placenta, not the lungs, serves as the organ of gas exchange. Disruption of normal neonatal circulatory transition results in failure to resolve fetal pulmonary hypertension and leads to its persistence. Pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease can be classified into pulmonary hypertension due to heart failure with preserved left ventricular ejection fraction pulmonary hypertension due to heart failure with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, valvular disease, and congenital or acquired cardiovascular conditions leading to postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. In left heart failure, pulmonary hypertension primarily results from the passive backward transmission of elevated left-sided filling pressures which occur as a consequence of systolic or diastolic left ventricular dysfunction. In patients with aortic or mitral valve disease, the presence of pulmonary hypertension indicates a decompensated state of the disease with left ventricular and left atrial dysfunction and exhausted compensatory mechanism. Congenital postcapillary obstructive lesions, for example, pulmonary vein stenosis, called triatriatum, obstructed total anomalous pulmonary venous return, coarctation of the aorta, etc., can cause pulmonary hypertension. Now, pulmonary hypertension due to lung diseases and or hypoxia. The causes include obstructive lung disease, restrictive lung disease, other lung disease with mixed restrictive or obstructive pattern, hypoxia without lung disease, and developmental lung disorders. Pulmonary hypertension is an important predictor of mortality in COPD and contribute to disability in this disease. Many factors contribute to the development of pulmonary hypertension in chronic lung disease, including reduction of the pulmonary vascular cross-sectional area due to parenchymal loss and accompanying hypoxia, effects of abnormal pulmonary mechanics due to hyperinflation, and also vascular remodeling processes. Restrictive lung diseases associated with pulmonary hypertension include idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, 
sarcoidosis, etc. Sustained hypoxia results in pulmonary vascular remodeling, medial thickening, and extension of smooth muscle into partially muscular arteries. Some important developmental lung diseases are alveolar capillary dysplasia, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, lung hypoplasia, etc. Pulmonary hypertension due to pulmonary artery obstructions include chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, other pulmonary artery obstructions like sarcoma or angiosarcoma, and other malignant tumors like renal carcinoma, uterine carcinoma, germ cell tumors of the testis, non-malignant tumors like uterine leomyoma, arteritis, congenital pulmonary artery stenosis, and parasites like hydatidosis. Pulmonary hypertension with unclear and or multifactorial mechanisms Hematological disorders include chronic hemolytic anemia, myeloproliferative disorders, and splenectomy. Systemic disorders include sarcoidosis, pulmonary histiocytosis, lymphangioleomyomatosis, and neurofibromatosis. Metabolic disorders include glycogen storage disease, Gaucher disease, and thyroid disorders, complex congenital heart disease. Others include pulmonary tumoral thrombotic microangiopathy, fibrosing mediastinitis, chronic renal failure, and segmental pulmonary hypertension. Symptoms are nonspecific and mainly related to progressive right ventricular dysfunction. Initial symptoms are typically induced by exertion. They include shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, angina, and syncope. Less commonly, patients may also describe dry cough and exercise-induced nausea and vomiting. Symptoms at rest occur only in advanced cases. Abdominal distension and ankle edema will develop with progressing right ventricular failure. In some patients, the clinical presentation may be related to mechanical complications of pulmonary hypertension and the abnormal distribution of blood flow in the pulmonary vascular bed. Hemoptysis related to rupture of hypertrophied bronchial arteries hoarseness caused by compression of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is caused by large airway compression, angina due to myocardial ischemia caused by compression of the left main coronary artery, significant dilation of the pulmonary artery may result in its rupture or dissection, leading to signs and symptoms of cardiac tamponade. Signs of pulmonary hypertension are left parasternal lift, accentuated pulmonary component of the second heart sound, right ventricular third heart sound, pansystolic murmur of tricuspid regurgitation, and diastolic murmur of pulmonary regurgitation. Signs in advanced disease are elevated jugular venous pressure, hepatomegaly, ascites, peripheral edema, and cool extremities. Clinical examination may suggest an underlying cause like telangiectasia, digital ulceration, and sclerodactyly are seen in scleroderma. Inspiratory crackles may point towards interstitial lung disease. Spider nevi, testicular atrophy, and palmar erythema suggest liver disease. When digital clubbing is encountered, pulmonary venoocclusive disease, cyanotic congenital heart disease, interstitial lung disease, or liver disease should be considered. ECG may provide supportive evidence of pulmonary hypertension. 
but a normal ECG does not exclude the diagnosis. An abnormal ECG is more likely in severe rather than mild pulmonary hypertension. ECG abnormalities may include P pulmonary, right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular strain, right bundle branch block, and QTC prolongation. Prolongation of the QRS complex and QTC suggest severe disease. This is ECG from a patient with pulmonary hypertension demonstrating evidence of right axis deviation which is shown with A in lead 1 and AVF, right ventricular hypertrophy which is shown with B in lead V1 and V5, right atrial enlargement which is shown with C in lead 2 and right ventricular strain which is shown with D in lead V2 and V3. This is ECG from another patient with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension demonstrating evidence of right bundle branch block RSR prime pattern in lead V1 with a QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds which is shown with number 1. Dominant R wave in V1 with RS ratio of more than 1 which is shown with number 2 and right axis deviation in lead 1, 3 and AVF which are shown with number 3. Chest X-ray may assist in differential diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension by showing signs suggesting lung disease or pulmonary venous congestion due to left heart disease. Findings in pulmonary arterial hypertension include central pulmonary arterial dilatation which contrasts with pruning of the peripheral blood vessels. Right atrium and ventricle enlargement may be seen in more advanced cases. As for ECG, a normal chest radiograph does not exclude pulmonary hypertension. This patient has pulmonary hypertension, chest x-ray showing enlarged cardiac silhouette and pulmonary trunk, prominent proximal pulmonary arteries and pruning of peripheral pulmonary vessels. The red one is showing enlarged cardiac silhouette, the blue two is showing enlarged pulmonary trunk and the yellow three is showing pruning of peripheral pulmonary vessels. There are enlarged right and left main pulmonary arteries with disproportionately small peripheral vessels which is known as pruning of pulmonary vessels. Pulmonary function tests and arterial blood gases identify the contribution of underlying airway or parenchymal lung disease. Most patients of pulmonary arterial hypertension have decreased DLCO. An abnormal low DLCO, defined as less than 45% of predicted, is associated with a poor outcome. COPD as a cause of hypoxic pulmonary hypertension is diagnosed on the evidence of irreversible airflow obstruction together with increased residual volumes and reduced DLCO. Arterial blood gases show a decreased partial pressure of oxygen with normal or increased partial pressure of carbon dioxide. The prevalence of nocturnal hypoxemia and central sleep apneas are high in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Transthoracic echocardiography is used to image the effects of pulmonary hypertension on the heart and to estimate pulmonary arterial pressure from continuous wave Doppler measurements. This is a list of echocardiographic signs suggesting pulmonary hypertension. Signs from at least two different categories from the list should be present to alter the level of echocardiographic probability of pulmonary hypertension. 
Signs related to the ventricles are right ventricle, left ventricle, basal diameter ratio of more than one and flattening of the interventricular septum. Signs related to the pulmonary artery are right ventricular outflow Doppler acceleration time less than 105 milliseconds and or mid systolic notching early diastolic pulmonary regurgitation velocity of more than 2.2 meters per second and pulmonary arterial diameter of more than 25 millimeters signs related to the inferior vena cava and right atrium are inferior cava diameter of more than 21 millimeters with decreased inspiratory collapse and right atrial area of more than 18 square centimeters. Now, echocardiographic probability of pulmonary hypertension if the peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity is less than or equal to 2.8 meters per second or not measurable, then in the absence of other echo signs, the probability will be low and in the presence of the other echo signs, the probability will be intermediate. If the velocity is between 2.9 to 3.4 meters per second, then in the absence of the echo signs, the probability will be intermediate and in the presence of the echo signs, the probability will be high. If the velocity is more than 3.4 meters per second, then the presence of the echo signs are not required and the probability will be high. Ventilation perfusion lung scan has been the screening method of choice for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension because of its higher sensitivity compared with CT pulmonary angiogram. CT may suggest the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, identify cause of pulmonary hypertension such as chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension or lung disease provide clues as to the form of pulmonary arterial hypertension, for example, esophageal dilation in systemic sclerosis or congenital cardiac defects and also provide prognostic information. It may raise a suspicion of pulmonary hypertension in symptomatic patients or those examined for unrelated indications by showing an increased pulmonary arterial diameter of more than or equal to 29 millimeters and pulmonary trunk ascending aorta diameter ratio of more than or equal to 1. In this city, the pulmonary trunk diameter which is shown with yellow line is larger than the adjacent ascending aorta which is shown with red line making pulmonary trunk ascending aorta diameter ratio of more than 1. At a lower level, the intraventricular septum which is shown with blue line is reversed and bowed towards the left ventricle. HRCT provides detailed views of the lung parenchyma and facilitates the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and emphysema may also be very helpful where there is a suspicion of pulmonary venoocclusive disease or pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. This HRCT is showing a typical pattern of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis main pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery enlargement are present. These are HRCT images from a 75-year-old male ex-smoker with combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema syndrome. Image A shows subpleural honeycombing traction bronchiectasis, emphysema, and a right-sided consolidation. There is also enlargement of the pulmonary trunk. Image B shows emphysema on both sides, 
which are more evident in the upper lobes in the same patient. This is a case of pulmonary venoocclusive disease. There is a patchy mosaic pattern of attenuation associated with interlobular septal thickening throughout both lungs. The pulmonary trunk is dilated. Here the features of pulmonary venoocclusive disease are the star symbol showing pulmonary hypertension, the dotted circle showing interlobular septal lines, and the arrows showing mosaic pattern of attenuation. Contrast CT and geography of the pulmonary artery is helpful in determining whether there is evidence of surgically accessible chronic thromboembolism. It can delineate the typical and geographic findings such as complete obstruction, bends and webs, and intimal irregularities. This patient has chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. This is her CT pulmonary angiogram six years ago, which shows pulmonary embolism on the left side and enlarged pulmonary trunk. This is her recent CT pulmonary angiogram showing complete obliteration of the left pulmonary artery. The pulmonary trunk is also enlarged. Retrospective compared to an earlier study six years ago, the cause of the obliteration of the left pulmonary artery is a chronic central pulmonary embolism. Cardiac MRI is accurate and reproducible in the assessment of right ventricular size, morphology and function and allows non-invasive assessment of blood flow including stroke volume, cardiac output, pulmonary arterial distensibility and right ventricular mass. It provides useful prognostic information in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension both at baseline and at follow-up. These are cardiac MRI in two patients with pulmonary hypertension. Here we can see right ventricular hypertrophy with normal sized right and left ventricular volumes. This MRI shows severely dilated right ventricle and atrium. The interventricular septum is bulging to the left and the right ventricular apex is blunted. Blood tests and immunology are not useful in diagnosing pulmonary hypertension but are required to identify the etiology of some forms of pulmonary hypertension as well as in organ damage. Liver function abnormalities may represent congestion, primary liver disease and or consequences of therapy. Thyroid disease is common in pulmonary arterial hypertension. Elevations of brain natriuretic peptide and N-terminal proBNP are associated with right ventricular overload and are predictors of worse outcome. Routine screening for connective tissue disease, hepatitis and HIV are required. Right heart catheterization is required to confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension to assess the severity of hemodynamic impairment and to undertake vasoreactivity testing of the pulmonary circulation in selected patients. Pulmonary vasoreactivity testing for identification of patients suitable for high-dose calcium channel blocker treatment is recommended only for patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, hereditary pulmonary arterial hypertension, or drug-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension. 
in all other forms of pulmonary arterial hypertension and pulmonary hypertension, the results can be misleading and responders are rare. Inhaled nitric oxide is the standard of care for vasoreactivity testing, but IV epoprostenol, IV adenosine, or inhaled iloprost can be used as alternatives. A positive acute response is defined as a reduction of the mean pulmonary arterial pressure of more than or equal to 10 mm of mercury to reach an absolute value of mean pressure of less than or equal to 40 mm of mercury with an increased or unchanged cardiac output. Only about 10% of patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension will meet these criteria. Now, the algorithm for the diagnosis of causes. If the history, symptoms, signs, and or laboratory tests are suggestive of pulmonary hypertension, we have to see the echocardiographic probability. If the probability is low, we have to consider other causes and or follow up. If the probability is high or intermediate, we have to identify high risk patients and fast track referral of selected patients to expert centers should be done. Otherwise, we can consider VQ scan to screen for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. If VQ scan is abnormal, we have to refer the patient to pulmonary hypertension expert center. Otherwise, we can consider left heart disease and lung disease. If there is no clinically significant left heart disease or lung disease, we have to re refer the patient to expert center. This is the treatment algorithm for pulmonary arterial hypertension. After confirmation of the diagnosis of the treatment naive pulmonary arterial hypertension patient in an expert center, the suggested initial approach is the adoption of general measures and the initiation of supportive therapy. Recommendations for general measures to avoid pregnancy, immunization of against influenza and pneumococcal infection, psychosocial support, supervised exercise training in physically deconditioned patients, in-flight oxygen administration in selected patients, in elective surgery, epidural rather than general anesthesia, avoid excessive physical activity that leads to distressing symptoms. Recommendations for supportive therapy Diuretic treatment in patients with signs of right ventricular failure and fluid retention Continuous long-term oxygen therapy when arterial blood oxygen pressure is consistently less than 8 kPa Oral anticoagulant treatment in patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension Hereditary pulmonary arterial hypertension and pulmonary arterial hypertension due to use of anorexigens, correction of anemia and or iron status, the use of SE inhibitors, angiotensin II receptor antagonists, beta blockers, and ivermectine is not recommended in patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension unless required by comorbidities, for example, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, or left heart failure. Acute vasoreactivity testing should be performed to predict response to calcium channel blocker only in patients with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, hereditary pulmonary arterial hypertension, and pulmonary arterial hypertension associated with drugs and toxin use. Vasoreactive patients should be treated with high doses of calcium channel blockers. Adequate response should be confirmed after 3 to 6 months of treatment. 
non-responders to acute vasoreactivity testing who are at low or intermediate risk should be treated with initial oral combination therapy with an endothelin receptor antagonist and a phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitor. Some specific pulmonary arterial hypertension subsets in which the efficacy safety ratio of initial combination therapy is not established should be treated with initial monotherapy. Endothelin receptor antagonists include ambricentin, bosentin, mesitentin. Phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors include sildenafil, tadalafil, vardenafil. In non vasoreactive and treatment knife patients at high risk, initial combination therapy including IV prostacycline analogs is recommended. IV epoprostenol received the strongest recommendation. Referral for lung transplantation should also be considered. Prostacycline analogs include baroprost, epoprostenol, iloprost, reprostinol. Prostacycline receptor agonists include selexipag. When the initial treatment approach results in a low risk status within 3 to 6 months, the therapy should be continued and structured follow up should be established. When the initial treatment approach results in an intermediate or high risk status, escalation to triple combination therapy is recommended. Referral for lung transplantation should also be considered. When the second treatment step results in the low risk status within 3 to 6 months, the therapy and structured follow up should be continued. When the second treatment step results in an intermediate or high risk status, escalation to maximal medical therapy is recommended. Referral for lung transplantation should also be considered. Patients on follow-up with low-risk status who deteriorate to the intermediate or high-risk group should be treated with double, triple or maximal combination therapy depending on the initial background treatment. Management of pulmonary hypertension in left heart disease Optimization of the treatment of the underlying condition Identify other causes of pulmonary hypertension and to treat them Perform invasive assessment of pulmonary hypertension in patients on optimized volume status. Patients with pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease and a severe precapillary component should be referred to an expert pulmonary hypertension center for a complete diagnostic workup and an individual treatment decision. The use of pulmonary arterial hypertension approved therapies is not recommended here. Management of pulmonary hypertension in lung disease Currently, there is no specific therapy. Treatment of the underlying lung disease should be optimized. Long-term oxygen administration has been shown to partially reduce the progression of pulmonary hypertension in COPD, but its role in interstitial lung disease is less clear. The use of drugs approved for pulmonary arterial hypertension is not recommended for patients with pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease. This is the treatment algorithm for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Lifelong anticoagulation is recommended in all patients. The assessment of operability and decisions regarding other treatment strategies should be made by a multidisciplinary team of experts. If there is acceptable risk benefit ratio, surgical pulmonary and arterectomy in deep hypothermia circulatory arrest is recommended. Riosigward is recommended in symptomatic patients 
who have been classified as having persistent or recurrent chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension after surgical treatment or inoperable chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Interventional balloon pulmonary angioplasty may be considered in patients who are technically non-operable or carry an unfavorable risk-benefit ratio for pulmonary and arterectomy. Severe persistent pulmonary hypertension may be bridged to emergency lung transplantation. Thanks for watching this video. You may like to watch other videos in this playlist. Please subscribe to our channel if you have not done yet.